When you're making a website, before we talk about typography, I want to talk about communication, because this is really the bottom line of everything we do on a website. Is It's communication. That's what our website is, is for. We're going to communicate with people or allow them to interact with the site. People don't come to our websites to see our awesome design. That's, that's not what their goal is. Their goal is to interact and, and to receive our communication. So if we're not starting out thinking about how we're communicating with people, if we let our design, our typography get in the way of the communication, that's a problem because then we're not serving the users. So this is an example of a responsive website that uses uh, media queries to change the typography across screen sizes to make it fit well within the size of the screen. And you can see as the screen gets wider, uh, this, the type gets larger, especially in the headline and the text below it. The sizes, the margins change, and everything kind of adjusts so that the type takes up and makes the best use of the space on the screen. You want to have small text on a small screen and large text on a large screen, larger text at least, because there's more space for it. So you want to make sure that you're taking advantage of that. Uh, this is Trent Walton's site, by the way. So when we're thinking about responsive typography, the first thing we need to think about is font size. You probably already know that you need to use relative units to set your font size on responsive sites so that your text can be responsive. So there's two different ways that we can do this, using either M's or REMs. And M's and REMs, they're very similar to each other, except for kind of one big difference, which I'll explain in a bit. Uh, but for the most part, they work in the same way as you start out with a default size and everything else is relative to that size. M's are, they get their name from the letter M in metal type setting. Uh, the metal letters like that when they did the printing presses way back when. The letter M was the widest letter in the alphabet, the capital M. So they used that to just determine how big the font was or the typeface was. And some people kind of, this is like a myth in web design that act, that actually transfers onto the screen, and it doesn't. You can see here the letter M in four different typefaces. They're all in a box that's one M wide, and yet the box is the same size. So that M isn't going to change size depending on what typeface you use. So that's something important to understand as you start out using M's. One M is going to be your default font size on a site. And then going from there, if you, label, if you give something a size of 2 m's, it'll be twice as big as your default. 0.5 m's will be half as big as your default. So it's pretty basic math you're doing here. You don't need any fancy numbers with lots of decimal points or anything like that. And then the code to do this in CSS would look like this. You just have, uh, for example, your H1 might have a font size of 3 m's, three times as big as your default, down to your paragraph at your default font size. And of course, if it's already your default, you don't need to declare that again in the CSS. So what that would look like then is this, with your H1 being three times as large as your paragraph text. So this is all pretty basic stuff. I just wanted to remind you, or in case you've never used M's before, of how this works. So the tricky thing about M's that makes them different from REM's is that you don't just start out with one default. The font size of every element is calculated in relation to the size of the font in its containing element. So in, for, in, for example, what you see here, the first line is a paragraph with a size of 1M, after that a div with a size of 2Ms, and a span inside that with a size of 1.5Ms. And this is what it looks like, because the div, or the span inside the div, that's 1.5Ms, is going to multiply against the 2Ms that that div is. So you're actually getting what's going to look to you like 3Ms of that span inside the div. So that does make it kind of tricky to use Ms. You don't just start out from a base number and calculate. If you put things inside other elements and have font sizes applied to a whole bunch of different elements, you can get a lot of weird things happening. But the trick to not having to worry about that is using thoughtful CSS. And what that means is just think about what you're doing with your CSS. And you should be doing this anyways. You don't want to just apply CSS willy-nilly to every single thing on your page. You want to be thinking about the best way to use your CSS and apply it to the fewest number of elements possible, which is also a good practice, which make, means there's going to be less confusion and your CSS is just going to be a lot smoother. You should only be applying font size to the actual elements, like an H1 or a P or any of those with a class on it and generally not to containing elements like divs or sections or anything like that. And if you start out just applying your M's as a font size to those elements, then you're probably not going to run into any problems. But using M's 
uh, there is an advantage to it, and that is if you set the font size for all the different elements within a containing element, you can change the size of everything all at once. For example, here we have a div, you know, and we have the heading that's kind of in a good proportion to the paragraph text below it. If we want to make everything in that div larger all at once, we could simply apply a font size change to the entire div, and it would change both the heading and the paragraph text, but allow them to stay in proportion to each other. So that's kind of a, a handy thing you can do. So that kind of, I, I think, makes it better to use M's because, you know, you do have that little confusing part, but I think this is a really good advantage that you can use when you're putting together web pages, you know, and, and be able to resize entire sections of the page all at once. So now you're wondering, what's that default I keep talking about? You know, what is that default size? When you're putting together your web page, you want to set your default font size on the body element. And this is the only time you're going to use percent to set a font size instead of M's. And the best thing to do is start out at 100%. And you're still like, well, what does that mean? How big is it? And the thing is, it's going to be different on every device. 100% is the size that the device, is, the device maker is going to figure out what's the best reading size for text on that device, and that's how big it's going to make the text. On desktop computers, 100% is going to be 16 pixels, just so you have a general idea in your head of how big that is. But on some devices, like some tablets and other small devices, it's actually a different size because they've determined that the text needs to be smaller or larger um, to be an appropriate reading size on that device. So for most devices right now, it comes out to the same size, but this is a really cool thing that makes it future friendly is that we don't know what's going to happen in the future, what devices are going to start doing differently as far as how they do the font size. So you know if you choose 100% for your default font size, no matter what devices come out in the future, that 100% will always be a size that's a good reading size for users on that device. So 16 pixels might still sound pretty big to you because you might be used to like the way we used to do websites. We usually use 10 or 12 pixels as a font size for text. You know, and it, it looked okay, you know, and that's kind of what we're used to, so this might seem pretty big to you. But the thing is, not everybody has the same great vision as you do. And it's especially a problem in web design because there's a lot of younger designers who have this good vision. And it might not even occur to them that when you get to be about 40, everybody's eyesight starts to naturally deteriorate as far as like things that you see close in. And it happens to everybody. So if you have people that are over 40, they're going to be looking at your website with small text and it's going to be hard for them to read it. You know, if you ever go to an office where there's, you know, older workers, you can walk around and see them all like squinting at their screen because everything's too small on websites and documents and, you know, it's, it shouldn't be a problem for people to be able to read what's on their screen. It should be up to you as the designer to make sure that the text is easy to read for everybody and not just for you who happens to have good vision. So this is just kind of a reminder if this isn't something you've thought about, it's a good thing to think about. And I don't mean, you know, people with, you know, visual disabilities or anything like that. I just mean normal people that happen to be older and can't read small text. If you still feel like your text looks too big on the page when you've made it 100%, scale is probably the problem that you have. When your text is big, everything else needs to be big in relation to it uh, to kind of even it out. So you have to have bigger white space and bigger navigation and everything else. You can't just make your body text larger and have everything else stay small. So make sure that if, so what you need to do if your text looks too big, look at everything else and see what else you need to change so that the scale matches on everything. So this is kind of a couple examples of sites. You can see on the small screen that there's not a lot of white space and the text is small, but when it goes to the larger, the larger size screen, the text gets bigger, but there's a lot more empty space to go along with it. The scale of everything changes, so it all will match. I have this weird tilted podium, so I can't just set down my water. I have to like put it aside and open it every time. Sorry for the delay there. So rems is the other relative unit that you can use to size your text. And they work similarly to M's, except for one thing, that your the size of the font always goes back to the base default. It's not relative to the containing element. You know that tricky part I told you about? Rems aren't tricky like that. They're very simple um, and straightforward except for the problem uh, that they don't work on every device. So you have to have a fallback. So, you know, this is kind of like a trade-off. It might seem easier to use, 
but you're going to have to do a lot more work to make sure that it works for every device. There's two fallbacks you can do. And the first one is, it's straightforward, but it's kind of a lot of work, and that's doing a fallback in pixels. So what you can just do is figure out the equivalent pixels for your REMs by multiplying by 16. So with a font size of two REMs, your fallback would be 32 pixels. So you just need to make sure to put the, pixel, the pixels first because the browser will look at that. It'll see pixels first. It'll see the REMs after that. And remember, it always uses the last CSS that applies to Nelman. So it'll do the last one of REMs if it can use REMs. If not, it'll ignore the REMs and do the one before that, which is the pixels. Uh, and this is for IE8 and older and uh, Opera Mini, and I think there are a couple other kind of obscure ones that can't do the REM. So you'll need to do a backup, either this, which is a lot of work, and you might not want to do it if you're not supporting all those devices, or the easy uh, fallback. And this is easy, but it isn't going to work exactly how you want it to. And what this is, is just not apply a font size to anything. Because the browser, remember, if you've done a page and put no CSS on it, the browser automatically has default sizes it uses for each of the heading levels and the paragraph and the other things on the page. So all you have to do is just set that base size of 100% and don't put a font size on anything else that's not in REMS. So then the browser will do this default font size for all the elements on the page. So that will be maybe not the exact font size you thought everything should be, but you'll at least go to the page and see the different heading levels and the paragraph text in different sizes. Because what you don't want to do is go to page and have all the text be the exact same size, because that would make the site really hard to use. So, but to make this work, the thing you need to think about, though, you might have done a reset CSS, you know, and you've probably used those, which they go through and they change everything basically to zero or a default uh, set value. If you have a reset CSS, it might be setting the font size for all the elements to 100% or to 1M, in which case this wouldn't work. So you have to make sure that you're not setting the font size on anything except that base element. So besides font height, there's two other things we're going to look at, which are line height and line width that affect how readable the text is. Line height, the first one, this is also called letting because uh, when they use metal type setting, they put bars of lead between the rows of type to make it further, uh, closer together or further apart. So the line height on a page, uh, it's basically how much space there is between the lines. So this is a line height of one, where there's no extra space, the text is just one line high. And this is a line height of two, where each line is two lines of text high. So if you've uh, used a typewriter, this is like double spacing, basically. And the CSS for this is simple. You just do a line height of one, two, whatever the number is. You can use units on here, something like pixels. That's not going to be responsive. But the best thing to do here is not use a unit at all, because it just looks at this. Uh, one is just basically one, two, and is twice as much. This is actually the only thing in CSS where you can use a numberless, um, where you can use a number without a unit and not have it be zero. So that's kind of an interesting tidbit. So this is what it looks like. The top one is a line height of one, below that a line height of two. So on the top, you can see that the, the outside box is still just the, the height of the text. On the bottom, the outside box, which is the line height, is twice as tall as the text. And the space is evenly split up between above and below the text. So this is what a line height of one looks like. The lines are pretty close together, which makes it hard to read. And they've actually done studies on how to make text easier or harder to read. And they found that when the lines are close together like this, it's hard for your eyes to go from the end of one line to the beginning of the next line. Like you go to the end and go to the next one, it's hard to pick up the right line and sometimes you get on the wrong line. So that makes it more difficult to read. It's actually the same thing if the line height is too high, that your eyes have trouble going from the, t from the end of one line to the beginning the end of one line to the beginning of the next line. So they've done studies to figure out what the best line height is. And it depends on things, some things like the typeface uh, or the size of the screen, but the average number for the best line height for reading turns out to be 1.4, which looks like this. So although it will vary a little bit, if you're ever not sure how, what to make your line height, you can just start with 1.4 and know that you're starting at a good spot. By the way, the slides will all be online uh, later. It's on Twitter right now, actually, so you can just look this up later if you want to get all the details. So on, 
you might actually want to change the line height then as you go from a smaller screen to a wider screen. On a small screen, you don't need quite as much line height. So you might want to start with a line height of 1.3. And then you can add a media query and say, for example, once the screen is a minimum width of 30 M's, have the line height be 1.4, a little bit taller. And then for a screen of 60 M's or wider, the line height of 1.5, so a little bit uh, taller than that. So it's not a big difference, but it'll just make things look a little bit more appropriate for the screen size. Things are going to be smaller and closer together on a small screen and larger and further apart on a wide screen. Vertical margins are also important, and what that is is that's a space above and below a paragraph. So that's what this looks like. On the top, we have a line height of one, and then the vertical margin between the paragraphs is one line. On the bottom, we have a line height of 1.5, and the vertical margin between the paragraphs is 1.5 lines. So by having it be the same number like that, you have an appropriate margin between the paragraphs to go along with your line height. And the CSS for this is pretty straightforward. You just use the same number, but for the margins, you stick an M on the, the M's on the end. So for the line height, you have no unit, but for the top and bottom margin, you use M's as the unit. So the third one, the third quality of text we're going to talk about is line length, which is also called measure in typographic terms. And this is the part that's really tricky on responsive sites, because we want to make sure that our lines are an appropriate length for, for reading. But you know, since our screen is flexible, the size of the website is flexible, how do we make sure that the lines are the correct length no matter what the width of the screen? So starting out here, you can tell that these are really long lines. They're going to be hard to read. You never want to have super long lines like this. It's the same problem I told you about before. You get to the end of one line, your eyes have trouble going to the start of the next line and getting onto the correct line. But short lines like this are also a problem for reading, uh, but for a different reason. Your eyes can go easily from one line to the next, but your eyes will get really tired as you go and read large blocks of text like this, just because they're moving back and forth much more often. You know, and, and by the way, when I'm talking about qualities of text like this, I'm talking about body copy, where, you, where you're reading several paragraphs, like in an article. You know, obviously, if you have like short blurbs of text in a sidebar or something like that, it's not going to matter so much to make it super easy to read by the correct line length or something like that. But for large blocks of text, you don't want to have short lines like this because it's going to be very tiring for people to read it. So they've done studies, and the optimal width. It should be 45 to 75 characters for each line to make the text easy to read. And obviously, it's just going to be average. Not every line of text has the same number of characters. It's going to vary depending on um, what words are actually being used, whether there's hyphenation and lots of things like that. So what you're shooting for here is just an average, not an exact number. It's important to decide on your typeface ahead of time because each typeface is going to be a slightly different size on each line. You can see here there's several different typefaces, and one line of text with the exact same letters in the same font size it can be a wide range of sizes. So if you set up your site and make sure all your lines are the correct width, and then you go change your typeface, it's going to throw off all your numbers. So that's why you need to ch choose the typeface first so that everything works out the way you think it's going to. So as you're working on your site, you want to be able to see easily where this 45 to 75 character range is so you can make sure that you stay within it. So one easy way to do this is to just, on the first line of text on your test page, just count 45 to 75 characters, and then stick a span in there and color the text red or something like that uh, so it's easy to see on the page. And this is something generally I do when I'm doing a test page and, and it's not something that's on the live site because then it's always going to be on there as I'm testing and it's easy to see. Uh, if you just want to test something quickly on a page or it's on the live site, this is a great bookmarklet that Chris Coyer made that does the exact same thing. You just install the bookmarklet and then you go to the page, you click on the bookmarklet and you can pick any block element on the page, click on it, and it'll cover the color the 45 to 75th characters red. So you probably don't want to use this on your test site because you'll have to keep clicking it over and over again, but for just quick checks, it's really handy. So I'm going to show you this website we looked at earlier again, Trent Waltzen website. So now that you kind of know what we're doing as far as line length and line height and font size, you can look at this and kind of see what he's doing as far as making the text get bigger 
as the screen gets wider, um, adjusting the size of the, adjusting the length of the line so it always stays within that 45 to 75 character range. So media queries, we've talked about these a little bit as far as where to change the font size, where to make different changes. And when you looked at that last example, you could see that the changes were kind of gradual as you went across the screen. There wasn't, weren't just like one or two big jumps where it went from a small size to medium size to large size. When you're doing typography, you want to make the changes as gradual as possible so that what you have is appropriate for whichever size screen somebody's on. Because remember, you're not just designing for an iPhone, an iPad, and a laptop. Remember, we want to get all those in-between sizes. Like there's you know, thousands of different models of phone. They're all every possible size you can imagine. So by making the changes gradual, then we can make sure that no matter what device somebody's using, they're still going to get the best size for that device. So you can use as many queer media queries as you want. You can, I mean, there's no limit. You know, people feel like you have to just have your two set media queries and put everything at those exact same points. But your typography media queries don't really even need to be at the same places as other media queries on your site. So whatever you're doing with columns or anything else, you know, don't worry about making those media queries match and be in the same place. Just put the typography media queries where it makes sense to put them. So here's an example on a test site of kind of putting this all together. Uh, so this is looking at a piece of text. This is on an iPhone size screen. And you can see that, I don't know how well you can see that, but I've colored the 45 to 75 characters red. And it's like kind of right in the middle of that red space. So the line is about maybe 50 characters long, which is a good, a good size. There's uh, screens that are not as wide as the iPhone, obviously, and so they might have lines that are less than 45 characters long. And that's going to happen sometimes. You can't always get everything perfectly within the range of size you want it. So sometimes you have to make trade-offs. So that means on a really small screen, you might have lines that are not quite as wide as you want them to be. You don't want to make the text smaller to fit in, fit in with the line length. So just do the best you can and make compromises uh, to make sure it fits good on every size screen, even the really small ones. So the code I have here, I have a line height of 1.3 and then vertical margins to match. I have a width of 94% for all of the text. So there's a margin of 3% on the left and right side of the screen. And it's really important to have left and right margins. You don't want the text to go all the way across the screen and touch the edges because that will create reading problems, uh, make it harder to read if it's touching the edge. So no matter how narrow the screen is, make sure you have at least a small margin in there so the text isn't touching. So if I haven't added any other CSS to the site, it's already responsive. You know, I haven't made it non-responsive, but when I make the screen really wide, this is what I get. You know, I get super long lines, and obviously we don't want this to happen. So there's some things that we can do to make sure that our lines are never too wide. And that's max width. And you've probably used max width in conjunction with images, and this works kind of similarly. And what we're going to do is take our block of text and give it a max width in M's and tell it not to get any wider. So what we're going to do is uh, use our text in here. And you want to use like real text on your site that's in the correct typeface and is the size it's going to be. And you're going to figure out when it's 75 characters wide, that is it goes all the way to the end of the red at the end of the line, how wide is that? And then we're going to tell the text never to get any wider. And you're going to have to do a little trial and error to figure out the right number because it, it can vary a little bit. It's generally between 26 and 30 M's. It's going to calculate it out to 75 characters wide. So here I figure that out, and I've given this element a max width of 28 M's. And that means when I make the screen wider, that paragraph, that text, is never going to get any wider than 75 characters. So I've solved that problem. I'm never going to have lines that are too long, which is great except I have all this extra white space on this side. So I have to figure out what can I do to take care of that white space and take better advantage of the space on the screen. So I'm going to go back um, to kind of a narrower width, and I'm going to make my window on my browser a little bit wider until I get to a point where I feel like there's just about too much white space. And this is where I want to add a media query and make some changes to make the text fit on the screen better. So to figure out where I need to put that Actually, the first thing I'm going to do is figure out what I want to do. And, and that's going to, I'm going to make the font a little bit taller. I'm going to make the font a little bit larger. And I'm going to make the line height a little bit taller. So the CSS, I'm going to put a media query of slightly larger font size. I'm going from 1 to 1.1M. 1 .1 and the line height from 1.3 to 
And to figure out where to put that media query, you can use something like mqtest.io. If you have this open in a separate tab in the same browser window, you just figure out where you want that media query, switch to this tab, it'll tell you exactly how wide that browser window is at that moment. So let me go back a little bit. So this is what happens. Then after you pass that point, the text gets slightly larger, and then our line lengths will be shorter in characters because the font has gotten taller or the font has gotten larger to adjust to the screen size. So then I can do this again. Again, I'm gonna go until I feel like there's a little too much white space, and that's where I wanna add another media query. And here I'm gonna go up to a font size of 1.2, and then also a line height of 1.5, add the media query, and then when I get wider than that media query, uh, again, the font size is gonna get bigger and the line height to take better advantage of the screen size. And I put these at 30 M's and 60 M's as to where I put these media queries. Those were just totally arbitrary numbers I picked. And I'm telling you this because somebody asked me once after a presentation why I picked those numbers. So they're totally arbitrary. You have to figure out where the media queries should be on your site because really it depends on what everything looks like on your site. You can't pick your media queries ahead of time. Here's a little trick that comes in handy sometimes. When you're working on an existing site or, or even working within a design, you're occasionally gonna have times where the lines are really long and you can't do anything about it. There's nothing you can do within the existing design to make the line shorter to be 75 characters or less. So what the, one thing you can do, if you're stuck with these really long lines, make the line height a little bit bigger than you would otherwise because that'll kind of you know, make it a little bit easier to read. So even though the lines are really long, by putting that extra height in there, it makes it easier for people to get from one line to the next. Alignment and hyphenation are two things that kind of work together that can make your text look a little bit better on the screen. So what you see on the left is justified text, and that's when the text goes all the way to the edge of the page. And you'll see this a lot in books or in larger documents where it's fine. If you have long lines, it's fine because there's plenty of space for all the text to kind of, you know, even out. But if you're looking at a really small screen, the problem you have is that it means there's big blocks of white between some of the words. If you see on the right, you can see there's extra space around the word and. And then on the second, uh, the second screenshot, this is left aligned instead of justified. So that there's not those extra spaces around the words like that which is good, that looks better on a small screen, but the problem then, on the right side of the screen, you can see there's a really ragged margin there. So what we can do to get rid of the ragged margin is add hyphenation. And once we add hyphenation on the page, you can see that the right margin is smoother there. CSS for hyphenation is pretty simple. You have to use uh, the vendor prefixes because it doesn't work without the prefix on every browser. Some browsers don't do hyphenation at all, and that's fine. You know, this is an example of progressive enhancement. It'll make the site look a little bit better, but for the devices that aren't getting this, they're not missing anything. You know, they just have a little bit more ragged edge on the text. If you only want to do hyphenation on the small screen, uh, because it's really only, it's, it's most helpful on the uh, short line lengths, you can just put it inside a media query and say, um, on screens of 40 M's or narrower, then do the hyphenation. When you're doing hyphenation on a page, you have to set the language. In this case, it's a language of English. If you don't set a language, the browser is not going to even try to hyphenate the page because it won't know what to do. It has to know what language to hyphenate in because, you know, between languages, sometimes there's similar words, but they're actually different words. They get hyphenated differently. And that's why the browser needs to know the language. If you put the wrong language, it can still actually, uh, it'll still probably do it right, but if you don't put any language at all, the browser will just refuse to do anything and it just won't hyphenate. So if you try to put in hyphenation and find it's just not happening, it's probably because you forgot to set the language on the page. So one thing that can really help, um, well, what you wanna do is make your text as easy to read as possible. So there's some tricks you can do to make things easier to read um, by making the line length shorter. Remember I told you the optimal reading length is 45 to 75 characters. The shorter a line is to read, like even if it's shorter than 45 characters, it's gonna make people think that the text is easier to read. So for example, this is Smashing Magazine. They have some complicated technical articles on the site, but we, they wanted to make sure that when people come to a page, people start reading this article and feel like they're reading something that's easy. 
So what they do is they use a couple tricks to make the line length in the first paragraph shorter than the line length in the whole rest of the page. And that way when you come to the page, the line length in the first paragraph is actually about 35 characters long. So that's too short for like a large block of text, but it's not gonna make a big difference just for one paragraph. So as a user starts reading this article, they're going to feel like it's something that's easy to read as they get started, and it's gonna make them wanna continue reading. So they're not gonna be all intimidated by the technicalness of the article, they're just gonna feel like it's easy to read. So there's a couple different ways you can do that. Uh, one way is to use first of type, and this code, what it says is it's going to go to the article element. The first paragraph inside the article element is going to have different CSS, a larger font size. So they did that. They also put the ad strategically next to that first paragraph, which also makes the line length shorter. Um, first of type doesn't work in every browser, uh, some of the older ones. But this is another example of progressive enhancement where it's okay if not every user gets this. It's just kind of like an added bonus. There's probably other ways you could do this, like putting a class on the first paragraph or something like that, but you probably don't want to go to the trouble because this is just kind of a nice little add-on. So if it's something you can do easy with CSS, then you might as well do it. Otherwise, don't worry about it if not every device gets it. So typeface, I'm not gonna talk about picking typefaces or anything like that. I'm gonna give you an example of how you can use a media query to make sure that users are getting the most appropriate typeface. So this site, they have their slogan at the top. It's pretty long, and they use a fancy typeface that only comes in uppercase. It looks okay on a desktop size screen like this. But when you look at their site on a small screen, it's a responsive site, but the problem is the slogan doesn't even fit on the whole screen. So to me, this doesn't seem like really a good representation uh, of the brand going to the small screen and only getting half their slogan and not even seeing anything else. So I would wanna make sure that at least the whole slogan fit on the small screen. You can't really make this particular typeface smaller because it's kind of an uh, unusual display typeface. So what you could do is give it a totally different typeface just for the small screen. And this is kind of a trade-off with the branding. You know, the, the brand people there are probably not gonna be happy if they can't get their fancy typeface on every screen size, but when it compromises the readability, you know, I think that's a trade-off you need to think about. Making it more readable might be better than making sure you're using the correct typeface for the branding. So what you can do with a media query is just start out using a default font, uh, font family like Helvetica or Sans Serif, something like that for the small screen. Then adding a media query and after say 30 M's or wider, then we'd give them this fancy popular, which is the display typeface they use. So that way on the small screen, they get a, a typeface that makes that whole slogan fit on the screen. On the wider screen, they get the fancy typeface that looks like they want it to look. Performance is another thing to think about when you're doing typography. And you don't think about performance a lot in design because it's not something you design on the page when you're doing Photoshop or something like that. But it's a really big part of the user experience, so it's important that you make the performance work really well on your site. And you don't, because there's things you can do with typography to speed it up a little bit. So obviously there's a lot more that goes into performance, but every little bit that you can do will help. You know, we've been using web fonts for a few years, and you know, they're really nice. They allowed us to use any typeface we want on a website, but the problem is every web font you use has to be downloaded. Uh, and this is what it looks like. You're setting the name of the font family. It sets what files need to be downloaded and then sets it for normal or bold or italic or whatever. So the first thing you sh should really do is use fewer fonts. For most websites, you can get by with one or two different typefaces. You don't need three or four or seven or 18, and you know there's some websites out there that have that many. But every file it downloads adds to the download time of the site and makes it slower for the user. So just by starting out with your basic design, cutting it down to the minimum, minimum number of typefaces you actually need will put you in a good place. But then for small screens, you can cut that down even more and use actually less typefaces for small screens, which generally are gonna be mobile phones, which are generally gonna be on a slower connection. That's not always the case. Sometimes, obviously, you have small screens on fast Wi-Fi or large screens on slow connections. But for the most part, smaller screens are going to be slower connections. So by, since we can only do this by screen size and not by connection, that's at least given, gonna, gonna help us out for small screens. So what we start is when we declare our font face, uh, for example, here we have a font family of an example font. 
When you put the font face in your CSS, just having this in there doesn't tell the device or the browser to download the font files. It doesn't do that until it actually sees it needs them for the page. So you can do all the font faces you want on your CSS and it'll just ignore them until it needs them, which is nice. It's not like images where it downloads everything even if the page doesn't use them. This is a really much better situation. So what you can do is start off with your basic CSS, use a default like Arial, for your font family on, say, your paragraph text or whatever. And then on a media query, so for screens with a minimum width of 30 Ms, then we're gonna use example font, which is our extra font that we have to download. And that way, only for screens of 30 Ms or wide are they even gonna download this font. So that'll save a little you know, download time on the small screens. But if you're doing that and you wanna use like a system font, like Arially I just used for the small screens, you have to figure out what system fonts to use. And the problem is they're different on every phone. Uh, dro Android phones only have four system fonts and none of those overlap with iOS. So you need to use a resource like this, it's called TinyType and it lists what default fonts are available on every device. So you just need to make sure you have one for every device type um, in your font stack. And then, of course, at the end, you want serif or sans serif or whatever, just as a backup in case for some reason it can't get to any of the fonts. So before we finish up, I have just one last trick for typography, which is really cool. Let's say you want to use an unusual font for the title of your site, but you don't want to download like a whole nother typeface with, you know, because when you download it, you have to download all the letters, numbers, symbols, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, some of the font services, this is Google Fonts right here, allow you to just pick the letters you want and only download those letters. For example, uh, you'll see the yellow part there. You just put in the URL for Google Fonts, text equals title of website. It'll only download the letters in title of website. So if I only wanted to download only 10 letters or something like that from that typeface just to use for my site title, I can do it this way and save not having to download all those other numbers and letters I'm not using. So that's just a handy little trick to use. And then you can get whatever typeface you want for that title. So it all comes back to communication. And the bottom line is that your type, typography isn't just decoration for your website. It's a tool for, to use, for you to use to make your text easier to read uh, and get the message across more effectively, effectively to your users. And that's all, thank you.